All right, and we are live. This is episode number three. Wow, we're flying through these like like going to business. So, welcome once again to the Wall Pen Podcast: The Art and Business of Wall Printing. I'm your host James, and once again, I'm here with Mark and Mark, the founders of Wall Pen North America. And with us, we actually have an operator. Um, just to talk about their journey through the process of the wall pen and how they made the transition from working another job and getting into uh, wall pen and making that their full time uh, job in their business, we have Joel Gerlach with us. So, welcome to the podcast. Hi, everybody. Oh, like good it. to have you, man. Yeah, it's good to be good here, to see you, Joel. Yeah. All right. Cool. So. Let's do just a quick introduction of who you are, Joel. Who you are and what business do you run with the wall pen? I, I wanted to interject when you said we have an operator here. I wanted to say I'm a smooth operator, but then my wife is like, uh, <laughs> um, yeah, quick intro on me uh, with Joel. Uh, my background actually is in the film industry. I worked on a bunch of no-name Marvel movies like Iron Man 2, Captain America, The Avengers, X-Men First Class, Bunch of really boring movies nobody's ever heard of. Uh, so, uh, worked in LA for about ten years. Uh, I was working on set, on location, uh, and then I started a post-production company, and then did a bunch of work for Disney and Lego and Marvel and and General Electric and freaking Minecraft, like all this crazy stuff. Before then, pivoting into VR uh, and being a part of kind of the early days of VR in LA and a lot of like the early virtual and augmented reality stuff. So I kind of, I think I always found myself on the, the cutting edge of technology and really being interested in what, what how people were pushing the bounds, both in cinema and then in, in VR, AR, uh, and now in, in wall printing. So uh, I think from that perspective, I'm a great test case for, for people who have absolutely no idea what they're doing, getting into something like printing. You know, I, I, of course, I was familiar with Photoshop and Illustrator and all that sort of stuff. And so I knew the concept of like, oh, I'm printing in CMYK and, you know, and here's the files I need to prepare for a designer. But in terms of actually doing the printing myself, completely no idea whatsoever. Um, however, having kind of a background in film and uh, in animation and design and all that uh, has definitely helped in terms of giving me a, a sense for what is artistic. Um, but then also like a technical process and a technical understanding as well. Uh, and so, um, but I love it. I, here's, I, I don't want to prompt you and say, you should ask me a question, but you should at some point <laughs> ask me a question about like the idea of permanence and why wall printing was so appealing to me from what I had done before. Um, but finally, kind of before I got into this, I was a creative director for an ad agency. So I took a lot of my experience in the film and design world. Um, moved out of LA to Oregon to raise a family, and uh, that's where I currently am. So I'm still in Oregon, and uh, and, and so I was a, a creative director responsible for big ad campaigns, local, state, and national, uh, and uh, and that was great. It's a lot of fun, but uh, wall printing was uh, was what changed the game for me. So I don't know if that's good enough an intro, but that, that that's where I am. <laughs> that's an incredible <laughs> intro, and and let's do it again. I didn't like it. Yeah, okay. All right, all right, all right. <laughs> It didn't feature me at all, Joel, so I don't, I'm not even sure why we're talking Oh, sorry. <laughs> and then, of course, the most pivotal moment was I met, met Mark today. There so that was excellent. Yeah. Changed the other <laughs> that's, like, that's like an epic, epic origin story. And there's no pun in, yeah. in, involved there with Marvel at all. So, hey. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, so, yeah, how did you make the transition? I mean, you, you went through all that. You're, you know, working in the film industry. I can imagine you know, the ups and downs of that, but like what led you and like, how did you actually find wall pen in, in that business and sort yeah. of how you started? Um, so I, I kind of found wall pen before I figured my own life out, uh, which is kind of interesting. You know, usually people make, uh, I would say strategic decisions. Like I'm going to, you know, change my career path into this. Finding wall pen was kind of a, uh, a completely unexpected turn of events. Uh, how I actually found out about it was, you know, I, I, I wasn't often on Facebook. Facebook isn't like my favorite platform in the world, but for whatever reason, I was just doom scrolling on Facebook. And you know how sometimes the algorithm will recommend different videos for you. And one of them, I think it was from Unilad or something like that. And it was like 10 new cool up and coming technologies. 
and they were talking about like robotic agriculture farming and uh, I don't remember what, what the other video, I do remember the robot farmers because that was, that was pretty bad. <laughs> uh, then coming to uh, one of the videos, again, it was like a 20 second snippet and it was a wall pen, uh, a video from wall pen, Germany. Uh, and it was actually like the first machine. It wasn't even the E2, it was the first one. And there was like, and now you can print on walls and it showed a design. And, and I don't remember what it was, but I remember they showed the snippet of like the one I think they did on concrete of the car, like busting out of the, of the yeah. wall. Uh, and I was like, Oh my gosh, that's freaking cool. So I like stopped the video, just Googled like wall pen and, and saw the, the website. And I think I was on their website for maybe 30 seconds before I hit the like contact us button. Oh, wow. Um, had no idea what it was going to cost. Uh, no idea whatsoever that it would like change the course of my life. It was more like, this is freaking cool. Uh, people can print on walls. That's, that's awesome. Um, I just want to like learn more about it. And so. Uh, I'd say that I think the next day uh, I had gotten an email from Marco saying, hey, I'd like to introduce you to our kind of North American. We're actually just about to start taking deposits for the E2. Uh, so they'll kind of carry it on. So uh, I, it's so funny because like I've made a lot of strategic decisions in my life. This was not a strategic decision. This was like, <laughs> this is cool. And it just kept continuing to be cool. And then... Like I got, I ended up coming with my partner, Randy, who, who did a lot of the financing and, you know, in, in LA, I was trying to do a lot of, uh, uh, fundraising kind of angel or seed investing for kind of some VR, AR technologies. And, and I think I had done, gosh, I think it was, um, probably a year and a half of, of finding investors. Uh, and I ended up with like 10 grand. Uh, I was in a meeting with Randy for six minutes. I was on like the third slide of my presentation on why we should buy a wall printer. And he's like, okay, I'm in, let me know how much you need. I was like, what? <laughs> and I still have like 10 more pages to go. Can I, can I just like get through my presentation? I'm really hard on this. That's one of my, um, that's one of my favorite stories. <laughs> and, uh, I was like, okay, uh, well, I guess I'm getting a wall print. So, uh, it, it, everything just completely aligned and it just kept being cool and it kept being interesting. And, and my mind was like, wow, this is like really cool. But and we'll probably talk about is it, it, it hadn't become something that I thought is a long-term business is more just like, this is cool. Uh, and so, uh, yeah, I mean, complete random happenstance to have seen that video. It wasn't even the, the, the funniest thing is it wasn't even like, an, an advertisement. It wasn't even Wallpen actually advertising. I don't even know if Germany knew that this video had basically stolen some of their things that they probably found somewhere else and cut it together in a compilation. It just was, here's cool new stuff. And it was enough to get me to go, I want to buy one. So here we are. That's incredible. And the rest is history. And then like where at the time, like when you made like the decision to, to make the purchase, were you also still working in the film industry mm -hmm. and doing this as, as yep. well? Yep. Yeah. So I, uh, I'm a serial entrepreneur. Um, I really like doing all kinds of, of different things. I like having side projects and things that, that are, that are interesting. You know, it's like, uh, I feel like life is short and so I don't want to waste time just ch chugging along. I want to try and, and do things. Not, not because I expect them to make me got tons of money, but rather just because I'm, I, I want to be involved in things that I, that I think are, are transformative or, or revolutionary or, or you know, changing the, the nature, cutting edge technology, that sort of stuff. Uh, and so at the time, yeah, I was, uh, I was actually working two other gigs. I, I, I was doing a lot of stuff in film as a creative director. I was working as a consultant um, for a, a web three company, doing a lot of their creative work. And so it was a, uh, it was a really busy time. And so, uh, for the first, and we can talk about some of it, but like for the first year of, of finally actually getting the machine and starting to use it, it was just like a thing that, that I was kind of doing on the side word of mouth, just checking it out. Uh, and people thought it was really cool, but I was so busy with everything else. And really, I found myself getting burnt out. Um, and there was something about this machine that like, I would, I would literally be in bed and I would think about the machine sitting in the warehouse and just go, 
man, do we want to know want when to you were thinking about this? Show? The warehouse at one in the morning yeah. and just start printing random stuff on walls, and, and that was the day. <laughs> the thought process was addictive. There's always a little bug in the back of my mind going, I think it's printing right now. <laughs> <laughs> The context of that story is raises a lot of eyebrows, I personally think, but like, hey, whatever gets you going, man. Yeah, totally. <laughs> uh, late night yeah. printing. <laughs> <laughs> what were you printing? The, the, um, the wall pen diaries. Yeah, 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 yeah exactly. wall pen diaries. And then, so you're working at this, like, sort of like as a side hustle kind of thing. Like, mm -hmm. how did you go about getting, like, your first few sales? Because, like, it seems like that's always the sort of like the, the one point with people is that, you know, they, they have the machine or even prior to even getting the machine, like the suggestion is like to go out and try to get that business. So like, what were some of your things that you did to get like those first few sales to get like the ball rolling? It, my first actual like paying jobs came from me texting people a Google album link, didn't have a website. I mean, technically that, you know, the business existed, the LLC was up and alive. I had bought the domain and there was just like a coming soon webpage. <laughs> and, uh, I literally was just like, Hey, here's some stuff I've printed in the warehouse or some stuff I printed for a charity event. And some of these, you know, like we could, or you, you know, do you think this is cool? And, and there was enough of the coworkers from the agency that I, I was working with at the time who kind of knew some people. And so they, uh, had known kind of what I was doing and they wanted to share it with some of their network. Um, and so some of actually one of the, the biggest first job that I got, uh, was for a food is like a granola factory out here. It's called Northern gold. And they had these super long hallways. They called it the prison, uh, because it was like long white hallways where their you know, the food assembly workers would come in. And they right. down this hallway and they, they head into like the actual food production facility. And, uh, you know, their corporate office was like one door away. So you walk in the corporate office and it's like beautiful woodwork and metal and all this like really amazing stuff. And then, you know, the food, food area was a prison and, uh, and they all, you know, we're, we're talking about how, you know, that it was a, a fire food safety code to issue where they would have loved to decorate that whole area. Um, but because it was food and because it was food and fire codes together, couldn't hang decorations, couldn't do anything other than basic uh, paint. Um, and so uh, the fire marshal, when they saw it, like when they kind of got clearance to do printing was like, it's basically just fancy paint. You can do whatever you want. That's not great. <laughs> That's a great tagline. Maybe we should... We should use that somewhere. Yeah. Basically fancy paint. That's yeah. basically <laughs> fancy paint. <laughs> yeah. And, Joel, just, inter uh, so in just interject here really quick, Joel. Like, yeah. One sec, man. Just really quick. Just because like I didn't I actually I knew about that job because obviously we were we were tied in with you when yeah. you were working on it. That fire code has come up in like three or four different places that like honestly, yeah. we probably should do some publishing of like all the various ways we've seen that. You would not believe how common that is of like you can't yeah. do anything because like great examples hospitals there's an infection yeah. prevention two things one you can't have an edge so vinyls out like seams any edges anything like that's a problem and also it has to um be able to take the cleaning agents that they use to sterilize hospitals another great example high rises like i think it's i have to look it up i think it's the i think it's actually international building code like past eight floors like the same problem with the hallways like you're not allowed to add flammable materials so, so in some capacity that's that's true and then, of course, Clauser, what, what was it in the schools, those fire doors, right? Yeah, they're fire rated doors, so adding material adds to the risk of fire. But yeah. since, since this is just fancy paint, um, we were able <laughs> yeah. to uh, apply graphics to doors that you otherwise would leave the hallways looking sterile and very much like a prison, really? at least it's the way it felt when I was in high school. The, the word <laughs> that I think they use is immaterial. Like it's not enough substance yeah. to add to combustibility. It's like, it's just, there's not enough there to burn for it to matter. Right. It's essentially yep. inert. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So yeah, I, that's like, yeah. I wish, I wish I could like walk you guys just one door over there. One of the things that I, wait, Mark, Mark, did I tell you guys about the, the magic eraser yeah. on, the, on the mural? Uh, like, I so, so. Oh yeah, uh, you did. Yeah, yeah. I talk about the durability of these bricks uh, yeah. all the time, um, and so 
Uh, I have like a big bottle of isopropyl alcohol and some Lysol wipes. And so when I'm doing demos here and I go to the, the mural print in the warehouse area that I don't really care about as much, um, you know, I'll spray lice or spray alcohol straight to the print and then I'll start scrubbing it like mad with a Lysol wipe. And of course there's a tiny little bit of, of transfer, but a, a lot of it is just a little bit of spray that is just, you know, kind of dust that has drifted the actual print itself is fine. And I was talking, I had a group that came in and I was, I was like, I'd love to take something stronger to this, like a magic eraser or a, you know, something. And one of the guys was like, oh, you have a box phone right over here. And I turned around and there's a <laughs> box of magic erasers sitting in my warehouse that I had completely forgotten about. And I'm like, well, let's try it. So I literally pulled out the magic eraser, which is, you know, it's, it's sandpaper it, it, for all intents and purposes. And uh, I spray out, you know, I squirt alcohol on it and start scrubbing the print. I, I have no idea what's going to happen. I'm expecting it to come tearing off and it doesn't, uh, I, I'm certainly lifting material off, but it doesn't create a damp, like a long-term damage. You can kind of see some lightning in the area where I'm scrubbing. So then just for the heck of it, I walked, you know, I took two steps this way to the actual paint that I had printed on and I sprayed the alcohol on it and started scrubbing with the magic racer. And I got straight into the drywall within like a couple of seconds of scrubbing. So not only was the print resistant to damage from a magic eraser that the paint couldn't handle, but then also the print itself looked great. And now I have this scrubbed out spot in, in my wall where you can tell. So now actually I do it for people when they come in, I'm like, Hey, check out this magic eraser. I'm going to destroy this print. And it, and it doesn't, you know, and granted, like the print is not, uh, you can tell that somebody scrubbed it with something. However, it's still okay. Like the print is not, has not been compromised and that just level of, of uh, resiliency, especially for a place like a hospital or something where they may need to come up and scrub something really well. Uh, is like, you, you can't beat even vinyl. Like you can take, you can destroy vinyl with a magic eraser and our prints are fine. And yet two coats of paint, it's completely gone. So it's like, uh, it's pretty cool. We got, we, I know we got sidetracked, but I, I, I love no, it. That's, that's love awesome it. because like, that's actually like something that I'm not sure if we've, if we've actually brought up yet is like the durability of it. Because if you think about like, uh, any sort of print that goes onto a surface, it's usually something that you can like easily wipe off. But knowing that there's more, it's, it's more durable than you would imagine it would be. Um, it speaks well. Like I'm just thinking of like doing a print in my kid's room and, uh, you know, if they were to write something on the wall, like we always use magic erasers to like wipe things yeah. down and wipe things off. Right. So that's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we've actually gone, it's... we've gone one step further in some of the, some of the research stuff and we've actually worked with an anti graffiti, like somebody who specializes in removing graffiti because yeah. we had some applications in mind that like, man, this, it's awesome how durable it is. I wish there was a magic button to put, take this thing off if I wanted to. We had some applications in mind where like, uh, like a little bit of semi-permanence would have been good. And he came up drawing blanks. Like, I'm sure that like similar thing, if you use abrasion, of course, like if you take a, a belt sander to it or a planer, like you'll get the ink off. But Just, what we always articulate is you'll damage the wall before you're going to damage the ink. Like it means you're going yeah. into the actual you know, abrasive side. So yeah, hundred percent, which is why we feel very comfortable rating it for exterior, right? It's like, honestly, besides UV, which is its own thing, like every, this black shirt is going to be, you know, white by the time I'm in the summer, you're going to fade things naturally with UV. It just degrades over time. Um, besides that, like, it's not going to come off, right? That's just never going to peel off. Like, which, you know, vinyl is like one of those things. If you say vinyl, I feel like everybody has like two words associated peeling and bubbling. <laughs> Like, as soon as I say yeah. vinyl, I feel everyone's picturing that in their head of like one of those two things of the, the last time they saw like a menu on a board, right? There was missing a letter. It's just like, it immediately looks so shabby, right? Whereas like, in this case, we can go down to size 14 font, you know, and still be crisp on the wall there. So it's a, yeah, yeah, it's interesting, the comparison there. Yeah. Well, and that's the, for me, I, as I've been talking to people, especially kind of locals who are uh, in kind of the vinyl printing, they're all wanting to get out of it. They've either already exited or they're wanting to get out of it because it's such a pain. You know, these huge, yeah. vinyl, especially if you're doing large format vinyl, the installation process is miserable at best. The material is expensive. Printing is expensive. Uh, and so we can come in and the printer does all, you know, essentially all of the work. There's uh, a... You don't have to yeah. lift these huge rolls up. I was actually talking just yesterday, there was a... 
uh, a, a girl who would come by the, the showroom and I was like showing her stuff. And she was talking about how uh, she did a vinyl job on a window. Um, she was expecting it to take 45 minutes and it was seven hours of oh. work because stuff was bubbling, the, heat, the window was heating and cooling. Uh, it just wasn't sticking. And so she had to tear it down and do it again. And it was like, that was what made her be done completely with vinyl. And then I've got my logo that I printed on my window in 45 minutes, you know, and it looks great. <laughs> and it's yeah. just like, you know, they, when it comes to just vinyl in every way, you know, the, the only, and I tell people this, like, even on my website, I have kind of like a comparison chart. And it's like the only thing that vinyl can beat our printers is just, you know, edge to edge printing because we have relatively like, you know, margins that we have to deal with, right? That could be, you know, 12 inches from the ground and ceiling and up to 20 some inches from each side, um, depending on the nature of the wall, right? Um, if somebody's wanting an absolute corner to an absolute corner, it's like, yeah, you're going to want wallpaper, you know, uh, or you're going to want a big vinyl thing. However, and, and I remember actually talking to both you, both of Marks about this before we bought the printer is like, uh, most clients are actually okay with the limitations of, of not being able to print edge to edge. If we can favor a design that's, that's floating, you know, printing a, a drop shadow. And that's my favorite thing. I love printing shadows on the wall. It just <laughs> you and Mark are like, crazy for the drop yeah. shadow, man. Clauser eats drop yeah, shadow yeah. for breakfast, dude. He puts it on a cereal, man. He loves that. So oh, yeah. no, <laughs> look at the print like, behind him. That's all drop shadow. Like, the entire thing is drop shadow. <laughs> If I could have a, if, if I was gonna have an affair, it would be with a drop shot. You know, leave my wife and kids for a drop shot. Um, yeah, there is definitely. You know, so it's just like, yeah. uh, like you could never get. I mean, you could add a hard, hard fake shadow in vinyl. You know, a little border on the edge of it that kind of looks like a shadow, but a diffused shadow on the wall. And the crazy thing is, you know, a shadow <laughs> looks so cool, but the printer doesn't care. You know, it's printing. It, you know, this additive ink anyways, it doesn't matter if it's just slowly fading it out over time. It's doing that with every other color it's printing. So it's not like there's a special like drop shadow mode on the printer. Like, no, the printer is capable of putting anything on the wall that you can imagine. A shadow is a stylistic choice that makes it so much more vibrant, but it's not technically any more difficult than printing literally anything else. And so that I think it's just like, when you talk about, especially selling this to people, it's just like, it, it wins in every category except for margins, you know, and, and it's hard to, it, it's hard to compete, you know, with that. And, and especially well, sure, the, the background image you got there is a great example of like the kinds of yeah. recommendations we would give people of like, it, it forces you outside of the box, you know, not to be like cliche with a pun there or anything like that, but that is kind of yeah. our way of describing it to people. It's like most images out there, even if you think about your own home, right? It's in a frame, it's in a rectangular frame because that's how we've done art for so long that a lot of people have a hard time. They go floor to ceiling, not because it looks the best, but because they're just used to that geometry. Whereas you look at the way you framed it and use the negative space as a way of drawing, like that's always our favorite stuff is when it like, because our, our tagline really, and it's hard to say and tell you side by side, maybe next podcast I'll do it here and here so everybody can see it. But like, like uh, vinyl is a sticker, this is a tattoo. And that's what's kind of hard to get across and why we always encourage people to come, you know, come check it out in person. It's very, very hard to get that. Like when you say drop shadow, how like actually remarkable that is that your brain, and we mm -hmm. talked about this in the last podcast, your brain, has, I've done signs where people assume I'm like off the wall, right? Like that, like they're just yeah. looking at a traditional side because the drop shadow is so believable. Do you remember actually, it's actually one of your prints that kept coming up in that bike shop. Uh, do you remember that accessories we printed? So you yeah. put a 3D effect on that. Man, I had people like kind of give me the look like, "Are you David Blaine?" When they went up to touch it, yeah. it's like I, I like I like hoodwinked them. I'm like, "Now you see it. Now you tell me went up to it." And they're like, "Has this always yeah. been like this?" It, it's quite funny and like like I was saying on the last podcast, that's something you want to plan on because like it may take away from the effect you're going to far. You know? Yeah, you make people aware. Like just the thing too about that print was I was like I remember being in Florida with, with you guys, putting opening up Photoshop and then going basically like. I'm going to print something. I'm going to make something that's going to be like a, a Hagachi. The printer's actually yeah. more limited than I. <laughs> yeah. I'm print like all this crazy texture pattern stuff with the shadow on it. And I remember like we were working on it. Like, it would be cool if we did this or like, how should we do this? And I just remember thinking like, yeah, this is like, this is going to be a real hard test for the printer. And it obviously right. wasn't because the printer doesn't yeah. care. But I think it was nine minutes. Told, like, oh, wow. Yeah. yeah. And I, I remember being actually, nine like, minutes because it was like, skinny or tall, right? Yeah. Like, so that's, oh, yeah. one of, this is, this was a joke print. I like, I, I texted my partner when I was working after I'd printed this, I was like, 
dude, I just took a chisel to the uh, showroom walls and there's brick behind there. And he was like, what the F are you talking about? And I like texted him this picture. And he's like, you idiot, people don't stack bricks vertically. And I was like, oh. <laughs> but I, I like this print because it's it's very, you know, it's, it's not a solid edge. It is very, you know, messy uh, around the corners, but it really showcases like, I don't have to print squares, you know, I can print this sort of thing that, that really changes kind of a common, you know, print. And, and, and actually I help people too. I say, you know, as you mentioned, uh, Mark, like having people come in and they expect a, you know, a canvas at eye level. Um, and it's like, no, actually I'm, I'm going to be doing a print in a couple of weeks uh, for uh, the chamber, the, the local chamber, and they have this beautiful new space. I'm like, yeah, we're kind of thinking about something right here. And they have like 14 foot ceilings. And I'm like, that's <laughs> yeah, of cool. Course. But yeah. what if we yeah, print yeah. something crazy vertical, you know? Yeah. And they, you just don't so, think about that because everything you've ever known is, you know, right at your I'm eyes. Curious. I'm curious, man, because you've done a lot of printing since we last spoke. And there's a whole, obviously, like, you know, if you and I got going on a, on a call, we'd be there for like 16 hours trying to cover everything yes. that we think yes. we do, right? But one thing I've noticed, one thing I love telling people about is like, I had this guy I used to work with where he called it like human ergonomics or something. I can't remember exactly what the terminology is, but it's the, the theory that like, if you change the color of the carpet uh, on in the bank, people will naturally line up like the carpet tile being a path, people will line up to the path. It's sort of like this intrinsic human behavior. And one of the ones I've noticed with our printing, and this is in particularly true, if you want a guaranteed, I promise you, I must be like 99% of the people, I can get them to go up and touch it and talk about it, is a big map. Have you come across, like, if you get a big map on the wall, people go and there's two things they do. Here's where we are, here's where my house is. <laughs> like, assuming they live there. Yeah. Guaranteed every time, every person goes up and does those two things. It was like, I had something I just studied while I was, I was there messing with people and looking at it. Every single time you go up, you touch it and you find your spot. And it's interesting how this printer does that in a way that like canvases, yeah. artwork, other things, they don't, they just, I've just never seen anyone do that with, with a piece of art. Like, oh, yeah. I'm not sure if you've come across things like that before, but yeah. that's one that I've noticed people always go to. Well, yeah. and, and here's why, like, I've been thinking about this a lot. Um, and maybe, I don't know if you guys have articulated it this way before, but one of the things that, that I've noticed printing on, because when I first got this printer, right, I kind of did what you guys did. I went to Home Depot and I bought every single different random piece of thing that I could, wood, metal, plastic, acrylic, and I just started printing on it. Um, happy to report that it sticks to everything. You can print on, I have not found a material that I can't print on, so there's Stainless that. Stainless steel oh, that's all right. and Teflon and are, are two that we can guarantee probably won't work. <laughs> yeah. Did you say yeah. steel and Teflon? Stainless, Stainless steel. steel. Oh, Anything steel. designed to repel it probably I'm not printing on my DeLorean, I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you can't give me the but, but, okay, so I have not printed on stainless steel or Teflon. I think I'm not going to splurge to prove you wrong. So it sounds like a very expensive test. Um, yeah. However, the thing that I've noticed about the prints is that because, you know, we're laying a couple molecules or whatever thick on the surface, right? It's not like we're saturating into the surface, which is why it's self right. on ink. But one of the things that, that I, I, I've realized that draws people in is that the, the, the prints inherit the reflective properties of the material we print on. So, you know, the glossier the paint or the, you know, the more matte the paint or the, the, the glossy metal or whatever. And so the reason why it draws people in is because there's a consistency from the areas that aren't prints and the areas that are prints that does not make it stand out. Like when you put vinyl on a wall, vinyl has completely different properties to it. And so just our brains don't think like, oh, that's a specular surface. And this surface is more or less reflective than the other. Uh, you just go, oh, that those are two different materials, right? With, with wall printing or whatever we're printing on, it infuses into the material and it looks like one, right? And so when people like the map makes total sense and the shadows on the walls and stuff like that, it right. draws people in because they can't see where one begins and one ends other than just, you know, the visual color information, right? That's actually I completely like, agree, man. I, I think that's, that's very much obviously true. And again, one of the, probably the cooler aspects of what we can do when you start printing on textured surfaces, 
brick and stucco. There's something about the fact that there's no break in like the texture shot. Again, tattoo is probably the best way to like describe it. It's like, it's not like you lose your arm hair. You know what I mean? It's not like you lose the texture of your skin or anything like that. It blends Mm -hmm. itself in. There's something about that texture that I just don't think we're expecting to see it. Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah, exactly. It's it's truly space. Yeah. It's amazing. This actually is a, this is the worst print I've ever done. Ironically, because this surface here is like a piece of plastic that's like stuck on top of the print and so it's all warpy and wavy. However, like even with it being probably the worst print I could have ever done, it is still absolutely beautiful, you know? So it's just like, even what I would consider to be bad, and, and I am, we can talk about this if we want, it's <laughs> like I am the worst perfectionist. If I see a tiny bit of banding, I'm like, this print sucks. And then like, I'll leave and then come back three weeks later to just, you know, check up with people and stuff and be like, Oh God, that print is so cool because I'm seeing it, how other people see it and not totally. with like the, there's a tiny bit of banding. It's a failure it's, of the it's print. It's operator uh, syndrome, man. You go to calibrate yes, and it's I, like, understand calibration has a limit to the material, the perfection of the material mm-hmm. in the space you're printing in. You will uh, very rapidly approach that. So a calibration no. file, if you're doing it in NASA, they would take a piece of white granite. They would like, create a vacuum and they would put it perfectly plain to the thing. <laughs> you could probably dial it in at that point. You know, you would factor in the earth's gravitational force. You would, you do all the things oh, you yeah. want you to get it dialed in. The problem yeah. is like, you're, you're never going to get those conditions on site. So don't worry. <laughs> we always have to tell people like, it's a little bit this, you're like, dude, it's not supposed to be like, I know what you're saying. Everybody wants it dialed and I understand that problem. And then that gets you in the mindset of looking at every single detail, the way like under a scope, like, is this perfect? And honestly, it's just not how everybody looks at it. Most mm-hmm. people don't even see those artifacts, let alone care for I, them, uh, you know. I yeah. literally had this conversation with one of our newer customers yesterday and he printed a 160 inch graphic on his wall and he was looking up at it and he goes, you know, I'm, I'm seeing a few artifacts or whatever. And I, I was on the phone with him. I said, how close are you to the wall? Can your nose <laughs> yeah. touch the wall? He's like, yeah, pretty much. It's like, just <laughs> stick your arm out and then tell me what you think. And he like <laughs> took, you know, took an arm's like, wow, this is incredible. I was like, yeah, that's how people are going to consume 160 <laughs> inches of graphic, you know, Yeah. yeah. Um, which is important to remember. We get, you know, as operators, we get so dialed into the microscope, you know, and the, the wall pen comes with, with its own little microscope, right? Like we, we've got them um, and it's important to be able to look at it. But in the grand scheme of things, like, you know, what you're trying to do is consume the artwork from, you know. I love that you just have the wall pen microscope just casually sitting on your yes. desk. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah, here it is. Well, and, and to just add to that, because I know James, I know we should probably get back on track, but I will say this one thing, like uh, I got to go visit a, a major print shop, you know, in the area. They do, you know, massive print. They have like printers the size of rooms and stuff like that. And they have a UV printer uses the same technology as, as ours. Uh, except it's printing downwards. And what's interesting about that is that, you know, as they print, they have to purge at every single pass because they don't want ink dripping onto the surface. Huh. And, and they basically had, had two options for printing. You're in your DPI flat, right? And you can either print it single pass or, or, or three pass. Uh, and so I was talking to the, the, the woman who operates that printer, and I was telling her about how many customization options we have with our machine. And I was watching her do a three pass print on a, on a large banner. And what blew my mind was like, and, and hearing her feedback and stuff is like, this is a print shop that I have to assemble and disassemble every single time I use it. And every single place I go, there's all kinds of unknown variables and no wall is ever perfectly true and flat. And yet, even with that, I can still, they may dispute this. Actually, I don't think they do. I think they would agree with me. I can still print better quality things than a dedicated printer in a dedicated printing shop that will never move. It's bolted yeah. to the floor, right? At five and X that the cost. just shows like yeah. the power of the technology that even though I am in what might be considered the worst situation of having to be in an entirely new place every time I'm doing a print, the quality of the prints can meet or exceed that of a dedicated printer. And that I think just shows ultimately how well built the machines are and how capable they are and also the, the the maturing of the technology and and how we can really like we can do stuff that other places would have dreamed about doing you know even a dedicated print shop so when i had some of the print shop people come to my showroom and look at the prints they're like wow these look these look incredible 
you know, this is better than the stuff we're putting out. And so uh, that, that to me is like, wow, that's a huge vote of confidence that even the printers are like, Hey, you're doing a good job. And I'm just, you know, setting this thing up from bags every time I have to use it. It's, it's not ideal. And yet it's, it's unparalleled. So it's a good point, man. There's, there's something to be said for like, <laughs> if you don't, if you haven't been in a print shop and seen the struggles they have, like, you don't know what level is accepted. Like if you knew it was what Ferrari was doing when you're fixing your car, you're like, all right, well, I mean, there's a limit, even if Ferrari's yeah. having this problem. Right. And these are to Mark's point. I don't know if you caught it, but like the machines they're using are hundreds of thousands of dollars. I mean, the guy that we work with, uh, identity mm -hmm. income in Calgary, I mean, those machines oh, yeah. are three quarters of a million dollars. They're, they're not cheap at all. Not to mention and the warehouse and the, yeah, yeah, the totally. whole truck infrastructure yeah. and everything you need to support that printer. Like, yeah. it's insane. It's, uh, like, acclimation it's usually, right? You need to have a special room that like you control humidity, control temperature, control dust. Otherwise you yeah. will definitely have problems, yeah. Yep. Something we found early in early days of, of rolling out this technology is sometimes having too much experience is actually not advantageous. And we pitched a lot, this printer to a lot of people from the print industry, and they just quivered at the idea of having to perform on site in front of the client. The idea it was the, the performance anxiety, and they weren't even printing. There's the idea of having to print in front of people, just like you know, shrunk them down to almost nothing. They have shoulders slouched forward, you know. It's true. Um, PTSD it's, from that it, one for sure. <laughs> yeah. yeah, but it's 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 the experience of being able to go out and then you know Joel's experience, who doesn't come from the print world and is able to execute on these prints, you know, almost flawlessly anywhere he goes on any surface and you know at any customer site, uh, really does show you that like yeah, sometimes you just got to get out of your own way. This this isn't what you've seen before. This is definitely yeah. something that's different, and you got to approach it you know with a different mindset. It's a good. Would have it's a really good point, man. It is because I think that like I think that mindset of like look how hard this is. I have to go perform and I have to this like it misses such an important and crucial part of the sales process of this machine which is like i'm not joking when i say david blaine like it's magic dude like i still oh, five years so later know how you guys feel when i watch this thing print i'm like i still can't really believe i'm doing this like i still can't really believe like a high definition image is going right onto this surface like i know it will i know when i hit go it's gonna work but i'm still mind blown at this thing that like yes the performance certainly adds a degree of complexity you know there's a there's a lot to be said for being in a controlled environment all those good things but by pushing yourself into the performance side, man, your word of mouth, your marketing abilities, the things to get the next job, the, the experience people have with it, there's almost nothing like it. You know, short of juggling chainsaws, I'm not sure how much more attraction you could draw on any given job site than have a robot printer. Well, and, you know? and every time I do a print, uh, not only the client, like the actual person who's authorizing the job, but yeah. anybody in the facility always comes up, they always have their phones out, they're taking pictures, asking questions, totally. getting super excited. I, I love printing in front of people because it's, it's a great chance to just show off how cool this thing is. And yeah. uh, I, I think that like, yeah, you could take somebody inside of a print shop and be like, hey, look at our printer, you know, but you can't be here while it's printing. Like, yeah, okay. Don't sneeze. But to walk, for somebody to see, you know, I took a cell phone picture of their wall, I did a mock-up, they approved it, I came in and set up the printer, and now the thing that they envisioned is now being printed on the wall. And they'll come back and they'll keep checking on it and they'll be like, wow, it's come so far. And, uh, you know, like, I I'm sweating a little bit because I'm like, oh man, my banding started to come back in, I'm trying to get my offset, you know, correctly, and I'm trying to print, like, I'm kind of sweating a little bit. And then they'll come in and just be like, just blown away. And then it makes me go, oh yeah, like, I'm, I'm, I'm micromanaging the printer and it's then people are freaking out how cool it is. So that to me is actually one of the best parts is, is Definitely. having people come watch it go and, and ask questions. And, and I actually, it was really great. I now tell people something I, I did a print at a school and, and the uh, third grade class came by. It was really great. Mark, you'll be so proud. They were actually at that. They were just at that time were working on converting uh, units to metric. And so <laughs> Canada. I was telling them, like, I was like, okay, you know, this print is going to take about, you know, 25 milliliters of ink. And the teacher's like, okay, everybody write down 25 milliliters. <laughs> and, uh, and it was with so these people. One of the girls who was there, um, I, and you guys have probably thought about this. this is the first time I had heard it. She was like, oh, like that light. I know what that light does. I was like, oh yeah, what do you think it does? And she's like, uh, it makes the ink hard because that's what happens when I put my hands in my nails. When my mommy gets her nails done, the light makes her nails hard. Yep. And I was like, you're right. Like 
I had never thought about like curing, you know, the curing it, it, it like a UV ink cured nail polish. And that's exactly what it's doing. And she made that connection. And so now sometimes I'll tell people, I'm like, yeah, it's, it's curing just like you would find in like a nail salon, you know, it's, it's hardening the, the, uh, the service to make it really resilient to, to damp and adhering to that thing. And, uh, and it was great. It's great to have a child's perspective on it. And again, like seeing it through their eyes and the client's eyes, like it's, it's awesome. I love it. I'm curious to know, like what, what I, through all your experience, like what's like one of like your best print jobs? Like what's like one of the best prints that you were able to get up there for a customer? Mm -hmm. that you can, like... Um, actually the best one that I think I've done was, uh, one on cinder block. Uh, so it's actually on my Instagram. I was texting the marks about it, but, um, it, uh, he had tried to do vinyl of his logo on, uh, on cinder block and it was, uh, vinyl just won't stick, you know, cinder block is porous. Uh, it heats up and cools down. Water will get through it. Uh, I was actually really surprised to hear that cinder block. Yeah. Like if it rains outside, water will leak through your cinder block. <laughs> and so, uh, or moisture will. And so, uh, he had pretty much given up on his shop ever having like a logo or branding on there. And he was going to do like a, a, a banner, like one of those, like, or, uh, oh, yeah you know, like tarp material, whatever that is, and then just tie it up around these, these posts. And so when he found out what I did, I was like, Hey, I'll come in. And I told him, I was like, Hey, I've never printed on cinder block before. Um, and so, uh, like I will, if, if this doesn't work and you don't like it, you don't have to pay me a dime. Um, and so came in and actually he wanted, I told him, I was like, we could print on the cinder block or we could put some white paint down just to kind of make it stand out. And he saw my whale print that I have in the warehouse where it's kind of a messy, like rolled on paint. And he's like, I like that look. I kind of want to do that. So I brought literally just a can of constructors paint, um, painted a little square on his wall, not little, it's actually quite large, uh, <laughs> printed a giant square on his wall. And then basically, uh, uh, did a, a print on there and I also convinced him to put a drop shadow, but I did a really subtle drop shadow this time. It was like 10% opacity. I think it was just like really, really subtle. Um, and then printed that on the cinder block and the printer, A, did great. I was kind of worried about it, it you know, how it would deal with the, the, uh, variations of it. It was very rough cinder block. It wasn't like everything was very clean. Uh, and it turned out to be, I think, by far one of the most spectacular prints I think I've ever done. Um, I can probably pull it up here, but it, it just the capabilities of being able to go, okay, here is a, uh, a, a cinder block wall, uh, and I'm going to do a print on it that like, uh, I think just, yeah. So here, let me just share right here so you guys can see it. Um, yeah, so here it is. Uh, so this ended up just being. I think one of my absolute favorites. So you can see there's, there's a guy, Chris, and here is the actual print. Um, and I think I have, yeah. So and there's the drop shadow on it. Can you guys see that? Okay. Is it showing up? There it yeah, is. I can see it now. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, having this, uh, having this drop shadow kind of printed on that area and then, and then having this really huge, so it dominates the space. Awesome. Like when you walk in, you just see this, this thing there and it, uh, while I was printing it, I'm, I'm definitely sweating. I'm definitely like, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know if this is going to work. We'll see. And then afterwards, I walked away going, oh, my gosh. I think this is by far my absolute favorite. And just like, you know, again, the, the properties of, of the entire uh, cinder block just coming in and absolutely uh, working so well, even with this really thin little text and the little shadow underneath it, it, it just was it was spectacular. I remember, so, I remember getting that text from you, Joel, after you had finished that job. There's like, and there is something to be said about being able to like share a print with somebody who's like gone through that. You know, like you said, yeah. you're doing something new for the first time. Uh, you're not exactly sure that you're, there is a performance because you're in front of a client. You get done with it and then you get to like share that experience with somebody. I just, yeah. I like, I felt like I was there just seeing that because yeah. I know exactly the feeling. And like, it feels oh. freaking great when you're done and you could take a step back, your printer's packed up. You're like, that is awesome. Yeah. That's yep. exactly as I expected it to be. And it's about as awesome as I've ever could have hoped. It's kind I of, love the fact here we go. <laughs> Wish me luck. I love it's the fact kind of... that you can actually see the print ahead, on please. the mortar. Oh, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I think, it's, I think it's awesome. You can actually see the print on the mortar itself, like in between each one of the cinder blocks. 
Yep. Yeah. Like the actual printer can actually move in towards the wall and then back out and keep the proper consistency of what the print actually needs to be at. So that's mm -hmm. pretty incredible. Yeah. It does. It's an yeah, interesting it's, print for a lot yeah, of reasons. Yeah, there's nothing like it. I'd like to see somebody try to replicate it without a wall printer. Like you think about all yeah, the yeah. other mediums of like every other way that you could potentially get graphics on there, right down to someone hand painting it. It's like, man, those skinny letters with a drop shadow, like that would, I'm oh, sure yeah. there are artists that can do it, but like that would not be trivial at all to make that look clean and crisp. Like somebody, you know, like what you have mm -hmm. there, vinyl, like you said, won't stick. Like what other options do you really have? Like hang a sign, like you said, hang a tarp, I guess, which you know, is kind of your other alternative yeah. there. It's, we should do a lot more cinder block. We've done a bit in Toronto with the schools, hey, Mark, which is very cool, but it's painted cinder block, so it's, I don't know, it's a little bit less. We should maybe, yeah. we'll, maybe we'll do some specials on that because I would like to see more of those materials getting represented. You know, some, some mm -hmm. ideas, some like very cool places that you open up as opportunities, like parking garages. You never see any graphic work in parking garages. And it's just like, yeah. you know, I'm, I'm struck by the word prison you used. I'm like, yeah, we just, we do. We have a lot of these environments that like, we don't put things and you start going down the rabbit hole. Why? It's like a lot of what you just described, right? It's like, eh, it's just by the time I do it, someone may peel it or what am I going to do? Hang a tarp? Like, what are your hand, hand painted you can do? But, you know, who's got 12 grand for a custom muralist and, and six yeah. weeks at that to, to get it done, you know? And that's the thing too, these muralists, they don't want to do like, Muralists don't want to do text and graphics and logos, no. you know, they no, want to whatever it is, their yeah. art style, their spray paint, yeah. their whatever, right? They want to paint random things up on the wall that they love. They're not going to do some corporate, you know, text, whatever. Uh, yeah. And so, or they might, but they'll charge you a ridiculous amount for it because they hate it so much. Whereas for me, it's like, I literally do not care what you right. want to bring. You can bring right. anything and I'll do it. Like, yeah, it's, it's, just... it's interesting. Mark mentioned uh, parking garages. I was actually in communication with one of our uh, one of the operators over in Europe. Uh, they just secured eight levels of parking garage. It's going to be like a three month project, and like they're they're clearing well into the five figures. Like it's a it's a huge, huge project they've taken on, and it looks awesome. Yeah, it's I a great idea, idea, man. It's a great yeah, idea. I love print ads. Oh, for God's sake, go and market this stuff for people. It's like, you look at how much you spend on a billboard. Like that shit is not cheap. Like it's not cheap. Go try to price out, like getting anything hung up anywhere where you're advertising your stuff. As all this real estate that hasn't been utilized. And again, you, Joel, that job is a perfect example of why they have it. It's like, besides the wall pen, what is cost effective enough to do logos and text and the things people want? How would you even go about that? And that you could guarantee in any yeah. meaningful way, right? Yeah. Yeah. Nothing. Yeah. Nothing beats it. <laughs> I think it's you're like the like the poster child for like the wall pen. I mean, just <laughs> just even going back to like the very beginning. I love the fact that you said that you didn't have a website when you first started. It was just like word of mouth. There's no website. People sometimes get so hung up on having to have a landing page for people to like to 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 land on to know that they have a business. But yeah. you like foregone that. You just went out and started talking to people. Google album. Like, hey, check out my Google photo album. <laughs> and that's it. got jobs because it was cool. That's, that's why we had the showroom. You know, I didn't have the showroom for the longest time. And uh, it, it, the showroom is great. It's awesome to have this. Also, just a space for me to kind of keep everything, you know, the, the printer assembled and not have to bring it back to my house or whatever. Uh, but then even, even without the showroom, like people are still – I actually had one job. Uh, it was kind of funny, I'm like begging them to come to the showroom to try and justify its existence. We're like, no, we're good. We want you to come print. It's like, yeah, but you can come check out the showroom and you know, like, see the prints for yourself. And they're like, yeah, we could, but we just want you to come print. And I'm like, yeah. well, uh, I mean, okay, but all right, fine. I'll make sandwiches. It's, uh, yeah. 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 it's good, James, yeah. that you brought that up because I did want to. I did want to touch upon that as well because it's interesting, and I hadn't heard that story from Joel, but it does touch upon what we find happens a lot with almost everybody who pitches this technology, is that if you're pitching it to somebody who might not be, who might not have an immediate use for it, the the first reaction that happens is they recommend somebody that you get in touch with, you know, check this out. I know exactly who you need to talk to. It is almost 100 percent every response we always get when we pitch this thing is like, you need to talk to this person because they absolutely have a place for this in whatever business or, you know, showroom or whatever they may be working on. So, um, just by being able to show a few videos in a Google album, you know, you're, mm -hmm. you're captivating people's imagination and attention and they can almost immediately place you and put you in contact with somebody who, you know, 
is ready to go or you're solving a problem for them, right? This automotive shop that has a cinder block wall. <laughs> it's, yeah, uh, it's interesting you bring that up, man, the, the prospects, because like some of the things people, some of the things people want to know when I'm talking to them about like this technology and tell me what you think about this pitch, Joel, because what I tell them, I'm like selling murals is kind of like selling puppies. It's like you don't need a lot to like get people started where they're not just like, I'm not going to buy this puppy, but my God, like, let's talk about it. Let's play. You know, it's, it's like one of those ideas. That, like you don't need a lot of justification. Like I'm not selling you valves you don't need or like PVC piping. Like we're something that's like, I don't need like insurance. I've got life insurance. Or, you know what I mean? It's like, no, hey, do you like this cute cuddly puppy? Because I'm like looking for someone to buy it. Would you like to hold it? For a while? That's what the wall pen is kind of like when you're like, this is what we can do. And to Mark's point. I don't want a puppy, but man, I have a sister-in-law or somebody who was just looking for one. Like you should get in touch with them. It's, it's one of those things that yeah. it's easy to start the conversation. I don't know what your experience has been like. Yeah. But yeah. And I mean, even like, like the, the, you know, I've joined the, the local chambers and uh, just as a way to, you know, promote and, and, and totally. get connected. And they, the That's chambers are freaking oh, out how cool this thing is. And they're basically like, it's amazing that we have something like this here and that you're not another mortgage broker, financial analyst, you yeah, know, totally. um, yeah. business consulting service. Like you have a product that nobody else has that nobody else can compete with and you're right here. Like I, I actually, I, there's, there's two people specifically from the local chambers that are literally going out. Like they said, she said that she's the, the board meeting, their, their monthly or the quarterly board meeting she opened with, Hey, I know I'm not supposed to do this because they're not supposed to promote businesses to the board, but like, check out this guy. And they all just like <laughs> looked at the website and were like, oh my God, how is this here and not in a yeah. bigger city? You know, yeah. which is a blessing and a curse. I am in a, uh, I'm in a, you know, city with about 200,000, 250,000 people. So it's, you know, a smaller mid sized city. Uh, if I was in a much larger city, I think there would be um, more opportunities, I think. However, at the same time, I'm kind of glad I'm starting where I am, e even though like, like our clients are anybody with a wall, you know, and even then they don't even have to have a wall. It could be anybody with a plank of wood, you know, <laughs> or whatever. Right? right. And so in some ways, like the verticals of like, I'm, you know, like if you're a, a financial analyst or something and you work with people in the, you know, wood mill industry, well, okay, there's, you know, a handful of like wood mills in the Oregon area, you know, direct area that you can work with. I, my clientele is anybody with a wall. So it's just like, even then, even in a small city, there is still, I think it's going to take years to achieve any degree of saturation because of how, you know, how much space there is, how the square footage of wall space that is available to print on. And so one of the, I'd say like the challenges in that is that people I think are just often associating any sort of interior decoration with something like vinyl, which they may have had a positive or negative association with or just painting it a, a solid color, you know, their brand colors or something like that. And they're not really thinking along the lines of, I could print anything anywhere for the most part, you know? And, and so like doing a degree of education and showing them the possibilities is, uh, it, it can be a little bit overwhelming, I think for, for some people, because it's just like the, the possibilities are endless. And so I have to kind of work to bring in some structure and to say, okay, here's, things that we can print. Tell me what you like and I'll go do some design work and you know, some mock-ups and stuff like that. And, and I'll try and come up with some things that we can print and that usually helps. Uh, but even getting to that point of, of enough of an education for people to have them realize, oh, like this is what we could do in the space. But once they do, the repeat customers are high because I'll print on one wall and they'll go, well, I want another wall. You know, I'm, I'm not quite as good. I, Mark and Mark, you know, they, they're pretty good at upselling on location. I'm not quite as good at that yet. I'd like to get better at being able to say, hey, while I'm here and I have the printer here, you want a logo over here or something? Um, for me, it's usually like, okay, this is the job we're contracted with. I'll print it and then I'll get back to you and do some more. So I, I do think that that's an area for me personally to grow in. However, even despite my, um, my hesitancy to, to be a good salesman, <laughs> uh, I still have people like, like to do some more because you can't like it, it becomes a focal piece for their for their space uh yeah, yeah. are you operating a machine solo you just go on job sites by yourself like you're, you're running the one-man show there 
Um, sometimes uh, Randy is, is nice, and he, the, work, the way we've worked it out is that you know if he's available, he'll come and my, my so my business partner Randy, uh, he'll come and and uh, help me set it up, help me make sure that my measurements are right, you know, and, and I'm not doing dumb things. And then he'll peace out, and I'll just sit there and you know watch the printer for three hours or however long it takes. Awesome. And yeah. he's available, he'll come help um, me pack it up. It is certainly much easier when you have. Like you don't need two operators, but to just have somebody right. who can help you load in and set up and then load out is a huge help. However, uh, there's also been many times when I've just done it by myself and it takes longer. And sometimes it's a little more nerve wracking if I'm doing like a, a taller, you know, extension on the boom or something. Um, that's like, that, that can get pretty heavy. Uh, however, uh, it, like it, it could easily be a one man operation or one woman, one person operation. Uh, I find it, and, uh, I find it you know, interesting how often I get offered help when I show up on site by the customers yeah. because they want to be involved in the process. There is a mm -hmm. like inherent, like, this is so cool. And it is easy to like, like sure you can take a bag. Like it's, you can get people involved. Cloud's and they feel like they've been able the to heaviest set up. bag. He's like this tiny little <laughs> yeah. person. He's just like, yeah, yeah, that's that's right. 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 Yeah. you're doing it wrong, stupid. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, and I love, you know, that... <laughs> But you know, the, the whole printer assembles and disassembles with this one tool, you know, like, again, like the German engineering in, in that is just so incredible that they, that they purposely said, we want to make it easy to assemble, you know, like we want idiots like Joel to be able to assemble this, <laughs> you know, uh, and, and it's great, you know, it's, it's great to be able to be like, you know, Randy and I both have one of these, well, in our pockets, we can tear the entire thing down in five minutes from, you know, doing a print, maybe five, 10 minutes max. And it's just like, it, it, it really is a, uh, it's just a well-designed machine and a well-designed process. And, and that is like, for a guy who had no experience printing whatsoever, um, like for me in learning color theory and, and the, the proper uh, ways to, to get the best results, it, it usually comes down to just experience and learning what is best, but it's not a printer limitation. You know, I, I, the way I describe it to people is it's like, you know, if you're going to do like industrial design or industrial engineering and you need, you want to go to like a CNC machine, um, you got to know how to use it, you know, a, a CAD software, right? Uh, you got to learn how to use and a CAD software is just like some of the most unintuitive software on the planet in terms of totally. the 8,000 buttons that they have here and all the you know, math numbers and things that are popping up. So you have to, you have to get training in a whole CAD software, then the training and be able to export it and then being able to actually do whatever you're machining or printing or whatever it is. And 3d printing is a little bit easier nowadays, but, but here it's like it, a lot of the things that, that are complicated really are just, what is the best way for me to adjust the image to make sure it's going to look the best? And then of the settings I have available, what should I choose? And then of the measurements that I've done, how do I just make sure I start in the right position and hopefully end in the right position? And like, those are things that, that require consideration and experience, but they're not, it's not difficult. You know, it's not something that, that an a average person would be able to, uh, or wouldn't be able to understand. And so, you know, for me, like one of the lessons I've learned is like, okay, you know, I can print at higher DPIs now, you know, with the software updates, it's gotten more and more, you can slow the passes down and get richer colors. Well, if I'm laying more ink down and I have dark parts of my image, you know, the, the brighter parts are gonna be nice and saturated, but the darker parts are gonna look terrible. So like going into Photoshop or Illustrator and adding a little bit of lightning to bring some of those dark layers up in value uh, so that as I'm laying down more ink, it doesn't become too dark. Like that, I would say is kind of the extent of really some of the, the technical process that has to be considered. But other than that, like everything else is just what is going to look cool. And, and that is like a, that's kind of a neat place to be in is, is to not, is to not have a limitation in terms of, you know, yeah. I need a, a high degree of technical understanding to operate this. It's, it really isn't. Joel, and you come with a lot of Photoshop background. Like you were, you were a unique operator for us, obviously, because I'm positive you would teach me a lot about the Photoshop elements and yeah. design work. Like, you know, your expertise for sure on that front, which is like something that we don't engage on very often in our training or our discussions. Because, like, probably I'd be asking you if anything. But that is something. Just if any future operators are looking at this, that like a lot of what we're doing on our team and and building out on our side is 
basically it's like this, like you're talking about like lightening the values and taking dark and this with the guy. There's a, we're building out a team and a process within Wallpen North America so that if you have those questions or those files or those things, you could work with us to, to just get those that, that level of expertise done for you. Most of the time, it's about a level of communication of knowing what you want, right? It's like, okay, I'm gonna go to a richer color, now can you compensate for that? It's like, it's mostly just about communicating. The actual act of doing it in Photoshop, once you know where it is, I'm not saying that's any small feat, but once you do, it's not like that takes very long or that's particularly yeah, challenging. Simple. And, and that's, that's a big part of what we're trying to balance out because it's, it's a common question from our prospects is like, and I actually be curious to get your thoughts, is like, how much design experience do I need to have in order to successfully run a printer, right? And that's mm -hmm. where we offer our premium design service is like, if you want us to flat rate you, you know, you give us the mood board, here's generally speaking what the client's trying to do. We will work within our artistic team and, and everything that we do to get our artwork for our own company. We'll work with you and we'll give you a flat rate. That way you can have infinite revisions. You could work with your client. You could do these little touch-ups as you test things or try things or show things. And you can work with us at a flat rate, which is kind of the hardest part about contracting that kind of workout is you're either paying by the hour or you're playing a flat, paying a flat rate with a limited number of revisions, which like limits your ability to maximize those dollars and makes it kind of unpredictable. So that's a big part of what we're trying to do in the background is offer things that like, yeah. no, you definitely don't have to be an expert. You know what I mean? We can offer a service or we can help coach you through how you take things. Cause it's not really the same thing as it's not really being an artist and it's not really being a graphic designer. Although there's obviously elements of both. It's not really what you're doing when you do the file prep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm curious about your thoughts on yeah. that, but. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I wouldn't, ironically, I wouldn't consider myself a, a artist or graphic designer. You know, my, my background yeah. is still production, even 3d and 3d animation. Um, I think, uh, whereas you mentioned, I, I probably have a, an edge is just, I, I think I have an innate understanding of like what I think will look good based off yeah. of kind of that background. And so I will kind of try and try again until I get something that I think is going to be like exactly what I want. Um, but even then, like printing here, you know, in the showroom was like, well, if I don't like it, I'll just put another coat of paint down. <laughs> totally. Yeah. yeah. And, and that's kind of nice. Uh, like this wall behind me, um, I, I've printed on this wall seven times and you wouldn't even be able to tell. <laughs> like, sure. And it wasn't like I made mistakes. It's more like, I just want to test this. I want to test that. Yeah. That's really cool. And, you know, that sort of thing. So um, I would say, you know, for people who are looking at like, oh, I need to be a, a graphic designer. Well, as you mentioned, yeah, you know, they, uh, there's, there's the premium services that I think is awesome to be able to offer operators and say, Hey, look, we'll help you with some yeah. of those things. You may not be able to do that because your, your background is in design work. Um, right. even then, you know, there are so many libraries out there, stock image libraries, stock totally. graphic libraries and stuff that being able to, even with a rudimentary knowledge of Photoshop or illustrator, you can create some pretty awesome looking things without needing to have you know, been the guy to draw it, you know, or the, right. the, the guy that's taking the photo or whatever. Uh, and so I, I really do think like that there is, uh, if that is kind of a hesitancy or limitation from someone, it's like, I don't know, if you're going to print out a flyer for your kid's birthday, what do you do? Like you might go to Canva or something like that and you, you know, do it and you print it out on your home printer. You're not like, oh my God, I need to have a, you know, I need to be a graphic designer <laughs> to do that. Like, no, you yeah. just like, you find a way to make it work. And it's kind of like with this too, it's like, uh, you can, there's so much YouTube courses on basic Photoshop basics. And then if you subscribe to a, my favorite is free pick. Um, I, I have a subscription to them. Um, I do a shutter stock and Adobe stock images and all that stuff. And so I will just like, based off those mood boards, I can go and find graphics or elements and then combine or adjust or tweak wow. And add drop shadows to everything, you know, so. <laughs> the Joel fil the drop shadow filter. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Like it's not right until there's a drop shadow somewhere. Someone has got to have it. Um, so, you know, I, I really do think that, that that's not a, as much of a barrier to somebody being able to be a successful printer as they may imagine, you know? And as you said, there's resources uh, that, that, that like we can offer them as, as a part of, you know, the wall pen service, but also totally. just like you'll, you'll find a way and it's totally worth it. If the most uncomfortable thing you have to do is learn a little Photoshop, like totally worth it in my opinion. You know, yeah, and at, at what point I was going to ask is like, sort of going back to like the origin story of like how you are now a full time operator. Like, at what point did you decide to make that transition from just doing this as like a side hustle to now like it being like your main job? Like, yeah. like how did you know like that was the right time? Yeah. 
it's that idea of permanence that I teased way back then. Um, I, you know, I was working on these, these huge projects, name brands, all of this, all of this big stuff. And I would spend, you know, days, weeks, months in, in pre-production, you know, sometimes days and weeks in the actual production or filming or something, and then days, weeks, months in post-production. And I would end up with, you know, a, uh, at best, like a two hour movie, or it might be a 30 second TV commercial or like a 10 second Instagram reel or something like that. And so all of this time and effort and energy was being put into something whose permanence, whose long lasting impact was negligible, you know, at best. And yeah, like I was responsible for the creative on some campaigns that people like genuinely remember and think are really cool, but that's not like. You know, it, it's a passing thought. It's it's here and gone in in, in seconds. The idea uh, it was interesting because I was I, I kept like I said, you know, I, I would be thinking about like literally thinking about the printer just kind of sitting by itself, not being used, and feeling this kind of desire to be printing again. And I, and, it, and I didn't really have the language or the vocabulary, knowing myself at that point, to go why I was so interested because like when I took the whole process of actually printing. It's not like any one of these things was like the most enjoyable thing I've ever done. You know, finding clients, right? Not that enjoyable for me. Uh, doing design proofs and mockups, eh, like not my favorite thing. Setting up the printer and doing a print, like it's kind of nerve wracking. I'm hoping I don't <laughs> yeah. screw it up, you know? I hope that everything is correct and that I don't make a mistake and have to suddenly find out what paint they use and try to repaint their wall and apologize the whole way. It's kind of nerve wracking. My favorite part is packing the printer up because it's like getting it all back <laughs> in and talking to the client about how awesome their print was. But when I, so when I looked at each individual piece, I'm like, there's no one thing about this that makes me go, oh my God, this is my favorite thing. And yet I was feeling so positively towards wall printing. And it finally hit me that it's, it's this, I don't know, maybe someday you guys are going to do a Ted talk about this, but <laughs> this idea of a, of a, a time to permanence ratio, you know? I, with wall printing or with, with production, I had a huge amount of time to a very low permanence with wall printing. I would even like a couple of hours doing mock-ups, chasing a client, a couple of hours doing a print. And now there's something up on a wall that until somebody physically removes it or paints over it, it's going to last. That is a very low time to very high permanence ratio. And so being able to do things like printing in schools, or printing for nonprofits or printing for companies or corporations. Like I'm doing something that is lasting and, and has a lasting impact. And, and it could be like a beautiful piece of art, or it could be like a logo with the drop shadow, you know, that is obviously a beautiful piece of art. Uh, and so like all of a sudden I was doing something where my time investment was going, was going to kind of go the distance. And that's really what made me realize like that was the thing that I actually loved. Like it was that idea of, of leaving a mark on a place in a way that, that made the place better. And, and, and one of kind of my mission is like, I want to, I want to be able to use this printer and be able to print in everywhere that I can. And then also use some of those prints to subsidize free prints. So like for small or minority owned businesses or something like that, to be able to go in and say, Hey, look, um, you're, you know, in a little tiny mom and pop shop, you don't have the money to do anything, you know, special. I want to print to your logo or a picture or whatever for free um, because I know what it's like. Like when I was, when I was working on this showroom and it was a mildewy, disgusting little uh, abandoned, not abandoned, but just a like rundown office. But when I painted everything, painted the ceilings, put in the LED lights, like it was cool. Like I could see the potential, but it wasn't until I printed my logo on the wall. The very first print I did was, was putting my logo on the wall and it was like, when I walked in the next morning and I saw my own logo on the wall, looking gorgeous, obviously, no drop shadow though, because I'm a dummy. I didn't realize how much I love drop shadows. You can call this episode like a conversation about drop shadows, because that's probably what happened. Well, like when I saw my logo, it did something like for me. Like it, it felt like my brand, my identity, my, the essence of this whole operation was there on the wall. And if that, and if it can do that for me, a guy who's clearly in love with, you know, this whole process, uh, and, and love like the result, 
I know it can also do something for somebody else who sees like if they see their logo or they see their brand identity or a statement they really value or something like that on their wall as a testament to whatever it is they believe and, and, and their space is like transformed by it. Like that to me was like, that's something I want to put my, my time into. So when I decided to go full time, it was super scary. Um, and, and it is still not, I mean, a lot of people you know, say that it takes about three years for a business to become profitable. So I'm about a year and a half in, and I'm certainly not what I would consider to be profitable. I don't, uh, I, I'm not deriving my main income off of this yet. However, being able to dedicate this to be as close to you know full-time effort as I can and using the networking and, and getting to know other people and seeing people coming here and get stupid excited. It's like, yeah, I'm on to something and I love this. And also being able to work with Mark and Mark and, and be able to talk to other people about wall printing and, and, you know, being able to interface with Germany and even like do some suggestions on things. And, you know, like my, my wall pen, uh, like they had a metal plating on the back of it and, you know, they were using a couple beads of glue to keep it on. And at one point it fell off. So I messaged Germany like, Hey, <laughs> this falls off. You should probably have more adhesive or like rivet it in place. And they're like, Oh yeah. Awesome. So they made a change to how they're you know, producing stuff because of the feedback. So it's like, I get to be a part of helping make this machine better and offering feedback to people. And that I think is like all of these things all combined to be like, yeah, why would I want to do anything else other than this? Uh, it's risky, but I don't know. It, it's really high payout for it being such a risk, you know? Um, and, and I, and I like the thought of going back to like a nine to five, even agency job, even if it was like a 200 grand a year salary, I would literally turn it down right now. Not because I think that this will make me a multimillionaire, uh, but rather because I'm doing something that, that is cutting edge. It's really cool. It's really efficient. I get to be on the ground floor and also it makes a difference for people like yeah. that. That, that is absolutely the most important impact that I could ever have on a place way more than advertising or marketing or even film. So that's my philosophy. And I, I may be a little more altruistic than some other people, but like, I just, that to me is what matters. And so I'm putting kind of, I'm, I'm putting my, my feet where my mouth is and, and going, this is like what I want to do. And, and I have not regretted a single minute of it. I've regretted other things that I've made. Like, yeah, I'm wasting time doing this, but not well <laughs> How's that for an endorsement? That's, my yeah, we're just going to grab I got, grab I got wall pen goosebumps. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's yeah. good though, because like it totally ties back into uh, what Mark Clauser was saying is that everyone's objectives, they're aligned, right? It's like everyone wants to see more ink on walls. So like yeah. by you being an operator who has the opportunity to make suggestions and then see those suggestions actually take like actually happen, it makes you want to help the whole process go through right like you want to help out other operators as well provide suggestions with everyone working together for a common goal like it's i'm i'm drinking the kool-aid just by doing these, <laughs> these, yeah. these i'm totally on board and, and and truthfully i can see the opportunity again you're working in like a, a smaller size city but again like you said like there's there's so much opportunity there so just imagine if there's other people who are sitting on the fence wondering what they should do. Maybe they need a website. You don't need a website. You can use um, Mark and Mark's um, totally. website or whatever as like a reference point, you know, just use a Google Doc with some references. Talk yeah. to people in your community and just get off the fence and just make mm -hmm. the decision. Like, try it out. See what happens. If, especially if you live in a bigger city, there's so much opportunity. Oh yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Definitely. And I tell, and I tell people all the time, uh, you know, the guys that the marks, the marks, uh, ref refer to me to, to tell them, I'm like, Hey, use my website, like steal my, I stole, I stole yeah. marks, marks of images. I literally like the you very first steal what thing you've been that getting, I Joel. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. I, I'll pay back in dividends. I promise. But as like, yeah, yeah, exactly. I would be like, Hey, look at what these guys are doing. I can also do this for you. Right. Like, come to my website and take my images. Don't tell people you did it. Just say, look, this is what the printer is capable of doing. And right, so my, right. again, my first job, I barely had anything. And yet it was the, uh, the, the concept Inc. website, I think was what, was what pushed one my very first client over the edge and going, oh, this is cool. 
You know, I printed the Wall Street Bull on his wall, and then one yeah, I saw that. It's really cool. Really cool. Yeah, yeah. And and it was just like he was the first one to go. Yeah, I'll pay you to do this. And so, like, I, I I'm totally with with kind of what Mark and Mark is doing, and that is just like use what I've done as a way to help you get going, and all of us can benefit. You know, yeah. I, there is not a doubt in my mind that ten years from now, this is going to be the way that. The way to do it interior design uh signage branding large format printing uh even artistic expression like all of this is going to be the way to do it and i hope that it's wall pen and i believe that that wall pen is going to be a major industry leader but there's going to be other people i mean there already are other printers out there but like there will be people who will copy this and create their own version and, and i think the industry is going to go through this kind of transformative shift and I would rather be on it right now and, and have first, you know, first mover advantage than to wait until it's mainstream. So like that again is, is why I'm, I'm so excited for, for this. And, and I'll get new people who give me ideas all the time. I had a lady call me yesterday. Um, she wanted to see if I could print on a 10 inch by 10 inch piece of cloth, a uh, photo that she had so she could put it inside of a quilt. And I was like, yeah, I, I, my print head is in Germany right now getting upgraded, but uh, I was like, as soon as that thing comes back, bring me some cloth and I will happily just for free, just print it on there. Cause I'm like, how cool would it be to be like, yeah, I printed on that cloth and it's on a quilt. And I told her, I don't know if it's going to work, but let's right. find out, you know, and and you gotta do it. Yeah. I love it. That's what gets me excited. Nice. Well, I think we'll end it there for today. For this oh, episode. Talking. Sorry, everybody. <laughs> no, no, oh, Joel, that was great, man. I, I was actually just going to say, like, I don't think we covered anywhere near enough on like the various things. Obviously, this is why no. we started the podcast. Is like there is so much oh, to yeah, go through so, so to We'd love to have you back, and I definitely want to yeah, get so. to Oregon. I know we were talking about that. I'm thinking maybe this fall I'll come out and see you, and we can just kind of compare notes yeah. and see what we can do about sales, and like see see what else we could do to like contribute from a from a wall pen North America. You know, obviously you've been. Yeah. One of the early adopters, one of the originals, you know, you know, a wall pen OG. So like hundred percent, I think, I think we'll try to figure out another, I think James would make sense. Let's bring him back for sure. I mean, we'll see what the people want, obviously, you know, if they okay, want more I'm going to have to give it to them, right? The lines, they speak for themselves, but yeah, <laughs> definitely we'll get Joel back yeah, here. I mean, I'd be happy to come back. I, I love talking about this stuff. I mean, it's, it's. It's hard not to talk about it, you know. I, yeah, I, and I'll plug Joel because he didn't plug himself at the beginning yeah. of uh, of his intro, but it is Joel at Surface Inc. Surface dot Inc. So get in touch with him. He's uh, he's always like you said, he's always question. happy to chat. Uh, yeah, yeah, Definitely. yeah. I could, the, the passion is the ink is running through your veins, Joel. It's running through your veins. <laughs> That's because I've spilled so much on my hands. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Awesome, I, I've ruined, my wife is so upset. I've ruined so many clothes. Because <laughs> nice, I'm just why, why do you think we wear black? Everywhere. Right? Yeah, yeah totally. I know. Yeah. I'm actually getting, I'm so excited. I'm getting actual surfacing embroidered shirts nice. so that I can finally be a professional. Yeah, yeah. I mean, this doesn't <laughs> make me professional coming up with my own logo on a shirt. That's, that's what really Totally. Is. <laughs> that's a bucket list item for sure. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. awesome. Awesome, guys. Until next right. time. Bye, Bye, guys. Thanks, Bye. everyone. See ya. See ya.